Well, welcome everyone. Um, for those who've been in the session, um, uh, continuing along, this is our eighth annual Global Child Health Lecture Series. Really excited to have everyone here um, in part of this. And today I have the distinct pleasure of actually um, introducing a, a longtime friend and a colleague, Dr. Leanne Campbell. Uh, she's a pediatrician by training and has been working, I think, for a decade now in um, rural Malawi, or, sorry, rural Tanzania, um, Mbeya. Um, at um, uh, the Baylor AIDS Initiative, and she's done just incredible work and is actually the, the local expert in um, Kaposi sarcoma because of the work that she's done. Um, she also holds an appointment with uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Um, so with that, Leanne, please take it away. Thanks, everyone. Well, it's um, thank you so much for, for listening, for joining today. I'm um, really excited to chat with you all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay, can can everybody see my screen now? Great. And if um, the connection drops or there's a problem with the technology, Teresa's got my WhatsApp so she can send me a, a message. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking about um, the first step is the hardest, integrating a pediatric palliative and oncology care into an outpatient HIV AIDS um, care setting. And as Teresa mentioned, sure, there we go. Hopefully the slide went forward for you guys as well. Great, okay, good. Um, I am um, speaking today from Mbeya, Tanzania, um, in the southwestern part of Tanzania. So it is um, remote from all of you. I'm gonna turn my video off for now while I'm um, lecturing and then I'll turn it back on at the end just to try to preserve uh, bandwidth. And sorry, I'm just uh, trying to get this slide to advance. Great. And I feel like sometimes giving remote lectures, it can feel a little bit impersonal. So I wanted to share a picture of myself. That's um, my daughter, who's three. Um, I'm here in Tanzania with my husband, um, who's also a pediatrician with the Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative and is lecturing actually in a couple of weeks. So that's what we look like um, as I go through this the talk. So my take home points for today, um, what I want you to try to remember um, is when you're working in global health or really anywhere, try to use your available resources to create practical, comprehensive, patient-centered programs. Palliative care is an important part of global child health. And then Kaposi sarcoma is an important pediatric malignancy, especially in regions with a high human herpes virus 8 seroprevalence. So a little bit about me, um, I went to medical school at the University of Colorado School of Medicine uh, back in 2003. During medical school, I had the opportunity to do international electives in Ethiopia and India, um, focused on palliative care. I then went to residency with Teresa um, between 2007 to 2010, and I did international electives in Malawi and Thailand. I was then hospitalist at Lucille Packard for a year, and I was able to stack my shifts so that I could spend months of that year also in Malawi. And then in 2011, I joined the Baylor College of Medicine International Pediatric AIDS Initiative. Um, so that program places pediatricians full time at sites largely in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but we remain faculty with Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I joined in 2011 and the Center of Excellence, the clinic in Ambea had just opened a few months before I had arrived. And actually, ART for Children at All had just arrived in Tanzania in 2008. So when I got there, things were really just starting to develop in the world of HIV care for kids in Tanzania. The Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative is focused on scaling up high quality, highly impact, high, highly ethical pediatric and family centered care, um, clinical research health professional training and technical support with a focus on HIV, tuberculosis, malnutrition, and malaria and other conditions affecting the health of children and families around the world. Um, it operates in sites largely in Sub-Saharan Africa and a few in South America and one site in Romania. 
in, in Tanzania that actually have two um, centers of excellence, one in Mbeya where I work and then one in Mwanza in the northern part of the country. Um, the clinics in Tanzania are the newest and youngest amongst the Baylor network. Um, so had a lot of opportunity to scale up programs. Um, over the, my time in Tanzania, I've had the opportunity to work with our team to develop programs to better reach the needs of our patients. So adolescent support groups, Kaposi sarcoma, tuberculosis, palliative care, and social support programs. And today I'll be focusing a bit more on our palliative care and our Kaposi sarcoma treatment program. So why palliative care? Why is it important in a global child health setting? Um, WHO defines palliative care as preventing and relieving suffering of children and adolescents who face um, a life-threatening illness. Um, of, it can include suffering in multiple domains, physical, psychological, spiritual suffering, um, also addressing the suffering that their family members may encounter. And WHO will put out guidelines for incorporating pediatric palliative care into um, other pediatric care settings. Um, some of the populations that may need palliative care include patients who have an acute life-threatening condition who may or may not recover. Palliative care can be incorporated um, at the same time as other life-saving interventions. So severe acute malnutrition is a very common global child health um, condition, and palliative care can be an important component of comprehensively caring for kids with severe malnutrition. Similarly, patients with malignancies may be cured, but also experience a lot of morbidity, both from their cancer and their treatment, and a palliative care approach can help to improve the quality of care they receive. I focus a lot on HIV AIDS. Um, we have a little bit of tuberculosis or multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, but those are also conditions in which patients can benefit from palliative care. Um, Things like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or resultant cerebral palsy can cause patients um, to have suffering on multiple domains and those patients can benefit from palliative care. I think it's important to always keep in mind um, in low and middle income settings, pediatric patients can experience a lot of morbidity, um, even those who do survive from burns or trauma or sepsis or severe, um, severe illness may ultimately have a lot of morbidity and really can benefit from a palliative care approach. I'll be talking a lot about HIV AIDS, but I think you can think about that, um, that as a placeholder for other chronic conditions when you're thinking about palliative care. And so recognizing the importance of palliative care in the most recent WHO um, HIV guidelines that came out in 2021, they inc incorporate palliative care, recognizing that patients um, living, people living with HIV can experience pain and physical symptoms that are related to HIV. They can have psychosocial distress, sometimes related to stigma and poverty. They may experience spiritual um, distress. And so incorporating a palliative care approach is, um, can help to improve patient's care overall. And while great strides have been made in the um, fight against um, AIDS-related deaths amongst kids and adolescents, there is still a lot of um, pediatric HIV-related deaths. It's estimated in Tanzania that about 8,000 children um, die from HIV every year, and there's still big treatment gaps. Um, so kids who are living with HIV who don't have access to treatment and then go on to experience complications from their HIV disease. Kids and adolescents who have perinatally acquired HIV are at risk for a host of um, comorbidities. Um, those are laid out well in this um, review article in The Lancet, but um, issues related to infections, to chronic inflammation, to um, having end organ damage from HIV infection can all result in a lot of morbidity, and those patients really benefit from palliative care. Adolescents in partic particular can be a tricky population. Um, they sometimes fall between the gap of pediatric and adult care. Um, this study looking at an analysis of palliative care for adolescents living in South Africa felt that, found that it was common for adolescents to be lost in the transition between pediatric care and accessing adult care. And adolescents are an important population. Um, while AIDS-related deaths have improved a lot amongst children over the past two decades, AIDS-related deaths amongst adolescents aged 10 to 19 have remained about the same. So there is still significant morbidity and mortality amongst adolescents, and they're an important group to receive palliative care. 
specifically in Tanzania, um, there's been some nice work done since 2007 um, by a group of hospitals with the Evangelical Lutheran Church um, that work to scale up palliative care services at rural hospitals throughout Tanzania. Um, and they've reached a lot of patients with um, community-based palliative care um, services. But there's still a lot of challenges. Um, there was an analysis of some of the palliative care services for kids with cancer in Mwanza at the regional medical um, center there, um, found that even though the palliative care services had been integrated, had been part of their um, cancer care program, that a lot of barriers still existed. Um, the article highlighted one example of a 14-year-old patient who had advanced osteosarcoma, and as it became clear that she was not going to survive, that the patients spent less time with her, they had less focus on this patient. And so stigma within healthcare systems can certainly impact patients who need palliative care services, but are experiencing life limiting or life threatening conditions. So a little bit about our program um, back in um, as we were developing our program, we had noticed we had many patients who were experiencing life limiting effects of their HIV of their tuberculosis malnutrition. We actually had one nurse who went to a palliative care training back in 2014 and who really um, took on the palliative care kind of mission. He made it his mission to integrate and develop our palliative care program. And so we developed a multiple multidisciplinary team. So incorporating um, social work, nutrition, our psychosocial um, support team. We developed a standardized identification and enrollment process for patients who need to receive palliative care. And then once patients are enrolled in the program, we have a tailored approach. We tailor interventions based on their issues um, to try to provide high quality, comprehensive medical and psychosocial care. For our medical care, um, we have pain and symptom management. We have access to oral morphine um, solution that we're able to use um, if a patient needs analgesia. We have wound care. We're able to give outpatient chemotherapy or antifungal treatment. We can give patients wheelchairs or diapers if they are incontinent and bedridden. Um, we have a nurse hotline where families can call our palliative care nurse at any time if they have questions or they are worried that their child is getting worse. Patients go home with a FACES score that's adapted from the um, school pain scoring systems from Kenya. So our palliative care nurse goes through how to assess their child's pain, how to adjust doses of morphine if necessary. For our psychosocial um, program, we recognize that there can be big psychosocial impacts of ha having a life limiting um, illness, both for the um, patient themselves and for their family. And we want to try to mitigate some of and alleviate some of that psychosocial um, stress. So patients meet with a counselor. We're able to help offset some of the costs of coming to the clinic by providing transportation um, reimbursement. We can provide food packages. If patients need to spend a long time in clinic receiving chemotherapy or an antifungal treatment, they can get a lunch through our lunch program. Patients who have palliative care needs who live within a 60 kilometer radius are eligible for a multidisciplinary home visit program in which we'll send a medical team person and then a psychosocial support person to the house. Um, and they'll take the medicines and then also help provide um, psychosocial support during the visit. And then we have a simple uh, wish-making program in which patients, I meet with our wish-making coordinator and they talk about a small a physical item that they think will help improve their quality of life. So kind of simple things, our budget is usually about $25 per wish. So not the, quite the same as like a Make-A-Wish program in the United States, but the process of going through that um, Identifying a wish um, really helps patients have a safe space to talk about some of their hopes and dreams. And then we try to make that wish happen. We usually try to grant wishes within seven days in case patients have a, a short life expectancy. Some wishes we've granted include a mattress. Um, a patients sometimes ask for clothes or sweaters or a dress or a radio. And then we occasionally we've granted wishes of bicycles, as you can see in the photo. 
And thinking specifically about adolescents, um, we really felt the need to have adolescent friendly palliative care. So we have age appropriate involvement where adolescents can be involved in some of those discussions about what are their wishes if they need more intensive care, do they want to be admitted to the hospital? Do they want to be at home? Um, our palliative care team talks with um, adolescents about kind of last wishes, making sure they get a chance to talk with family members or writing letters, um, planning for end of life if that's an important component. We have a day program where adolescents who experience a lot of stigma or social isolation are able to come to the clinic and spend the day receiving medical care, taking their medicines, receiving peer support while they're at the clinic. Um, and then at the end of the day, they go back to their home. Um, we have the, a peer support program where adolescents with palliative care needs can be linked with an adolescent um, who's part of our um, clinical team to help provide them support, checking in with phone calls and visiting them at home. And then patients can do a memory making activity where they have photos taken and have them framed to, to remain for their family members after they pass away. And some of the resources that we have found helpful as we've developed this program, the International Children's Palliative Care Network um, is a great resource, has lots of online uh, modules with education. Our palliative care team's gone through the modules. Of course, WHO puts out helpful guidelines about management of chronic pain. The African Palliative Care Association has great conferences and resources and scholarships um, that are accessible to some of our staff to get additional training in palliative care. We got a small grant through the African Palliative Care Association and the True Colors Trust that helped to fund some of our program. And then most recently we received an iCatch grant. We also partner with the National Pediatric Oncology Program in um, Dar es Salaam, who helps us with chemotherapy um, for patients who need it. And then um, this really practical handbook of children's palliative care is free to download PDF book. And it's really practical and useful for really um, clinicians at any level um, that goes through particular symptoms and then has an approach of how to address them using resources that you probably have in your site. So just a little snapshot of the type of patients who received palliative care. This was between when we started the program in March 2014 and December 2019. It was just a retrospective review. Um, in that time, we enrolled about 102 patients. Most of our patients were adolescents, about 80%. Um, most of our patients were on ART, but despite that, many patients had severe immunosuppression, severe acute malnutrition was common, tuberculosis and Kaposi sarcoma were common diagnoses, cryptococcal meningitis, stroke, chronic lung disease as a result of HIV infection were other common diagnoses. Um, we had a couple of patients with other malignancies, one with osteosarcoma and one with a neuroblastoma. And then the outcomes of patients in this program, actually of part, among participants, about 50% survived um, as a result of the ART, the intensive support they received, and then went on to no longer need the palliative care um, support. About 40% of our patients died. We had two, uh, a few who were lost to follow up and then a few patients who were transferred out. Um, about 83% of our patients received analgesia. Um, we had a national stock out of morphine between 2015 to 2016, so that was a bit of a challenge. And then about 50% of our patients were able to participate in a wish-making activity. And then one kind of snapshot example of a patient who benefited from our palliative care program is highlighted by this patient. Um, she was a 10-year-old girl who had um, severe immunosuppression and had disseminated histoplasmosis that resulted in um, large skin wounds. She needed um, IV amphotericin that we did at our um, outpatient center. There wasn't a, um, a place to be able to give her IV amphotericin at the hospital. And she experienced a lot of morbidity from the wounds and from the side effects from the medication. Um, but the palliative care program was really able to address all of her issues. Um, and she is now six years later, she's thriving. She's fully virally suppressed and her histoplasmosis is healed. 
So now shifting gears just a little bit, I'm going to talk about another condition from which patients benefit from palliative care, um, but talk a little bit about Kaposi sarcoma. I'll talk briefly about the geographic distribution of pedi um, pediatric Kaposi sarcoma, some of the clinical features of pediatric Kaposi sarcoma and the phenotypic variation, and then our program to treat kids with Kaposi sarcoma. So we know that human herpes virus 8, which is the organism that drives Kaposi sarcoma, has a pretty wide geographic variation. On this map, countries that are in purple have higher human herpes virus 8 seroprevalence, and those that are the light tan color are lower human herpes virus 8 seroprevalence. Tanzania and other countries in East Africa are among some of the highest in the world, um, and it, seroprevalence increases with age. This study looking at prevalence amongst families in rural Tanzania found about 4% in infants, 58% amongst children ages 3 to 4, and then 89% um, HHV-8 seroprevalence amongst adults over the age of 45. In most people who acquire human herpes virus 8, um, it is a mild self-limiting viral um, illness, but in some patients, it can drive the formation of Kaposi sarcoma. And so because of the HIV pandemic, in the setting of high human virus, human herpes virus 8, Kaposi sarcoma is a really important malignancy in East and Central Africa. In many places, it's amongst the top three pediatric malignancies, and it's estimated to have a disease bur burden that's greater than ALL in the United States. Um, the study that I highlighted at the top was looking at Kaposi sar sarcoma risk amongst kids and adolescents who are receiving ART, looking at different sites. Um, and in East Africa, it was estimated to be at 83 um, cases per 100,000 person year in contrast with Southern Africa, which is 11, or Europe, which is zero. KS can manifest in different ways. We'll look at pictures of some of these clinical manifestations in a moment, but I wanted you to be familiar with it in case it's something that you see when you are working in a setting that has high human herpes virus H zero prevalence. Patients can get hyperpigmented macules or papules of the skin. They can have lesions of the mouth. They can get um, a, what's called woody edema. So it's a very firm, non-pitting um, edema that has kind of like a texture of tree bark. If you feel it, it feels very, very firm. Patients can have lymphadenopathy, they can have subcutaneous nodules, and they can also have non-wooding edema. Um, sometimes that can overlap or could be clinically confusing with severe acute malnutrition. And then the team, um, myself, and then the team working in Malawi has developed a pediatric specific um, KS staging classification to address different clinical phenotypes of Kaposi sarcoma, and then um, develop an approach to treating these different types. So I'll go through each of these classifications with some photos, um, but basically classifying stage one, mild and moderate, stage two, predominantly lymphadenopathic, stage three, woody edema, and then stage four, visceral or disseminated. So patients with a stage one, the mild to moderate mucocutaneous disease, um, are characterized by a disease that's limited to the skin, a flat oral mucosal lesion, or flesh-colored subcutaneous nodules. The photo there shows the subcutaneous nodules where the color of the skin hasn't changed, but there's a swelling beneath the skin. Um, patients with moderate um, cutaneous disease may have between 10 to 19 skin lesions, um, have nodular oral involvement, or have an um, exophytic mask or conjunctival eye involvement, which is shown in the picture there. Lymphadenopathic KS is when patients have kind of lymph node involvement with or without any of the criteria for patients with stage one disease. Um, it's important to remember that patients can present with lymphadenopathy alone, and an HIV positive child who presents with lymphadenopathy can have that lymphadenopathy from multiple reasons. Um, it could be from tuberculosis, it could be from lymphoma, or it could be from Kaposi sarcoma. And so um, tissue diagnosis is really important, but is sometimes difficult. Um, and this case talks about a patient who had lymphadenopathy, People were not sure what was wrong with the patient. He received treatment for lymphoma, for tuberculosis, did not improve. Finally, they realized that patient had Kaposi sarcoma. 
patients who present with lymphadenopathy alone without any skin lesions can be tricky to diagnose, um, especially if it's tough to get a biopsy, but it's really important um, to establish, establish the diagnosis for those patients. These are some um, photos of what the lymphadenopathy might look like. It's typically generalized, bulky, more than two centimeters in multiple sites. Inguinal involvement is quite common in Kaposi's sarcoma, and inguinal involvement of lymph nodes is quite uncommon in tuberculosis. So that can help you if you're trying to figure out is this lymphadenopathy from tuberculosis or not. What do you edema? So kind of looks like these um, photos here. So where the um, skin is uh, sort of darkish in color. If you feel the extremity, it will feel very hard. Um, almost like as if you're touching some tree bark. And then stage four disease is when patients have disseminated and or visceral involvement. So if they have clinical pulmonary or abdominal visceral involvement, or if they have more than 20 skin lesions, we classify them as a stage four patient. Pulmonary Kaposi sarcoma, we define as reticulonodular infiltrates or pleural effusions that are not attributable to other pulmonary pathologies. So if somebody has pleural effusions and they don't get better after two weeks of typically anti-TB, um, maybe also with antibacterial treatment, we would classify that person as having pulmonary KS. If you were to drain the fluid, it's typically serosanguinous. And the cytology typically does not show malignant cells if you were to look at that fluid under a microscope or send it to pathology. If patients have clinical evidence of an upper airway obstruction, then we'll also classify those patients as having pulmonary disease. And these are some examples of x-rays findings of patients who had pulmonary disease. Um, so reticulonodular infiltrates, micronodules, pleural effusions could be quite difficult to distinguish on the basis of x-ray findings alone between pulmonary Kaposi sarcoma and tuberculosis, like a miliary tuberculosis. So you might need to use the other clinical features of your patient to, to put that together to decide whether or not you think they have pulmonary involvement. And then for gastrointestinal um, involvement, we define that as somebody with KS with persistent bloody stool that's not attributable to another cause of hemorrhagic colitis. So similarly, we might treat them with antibiotics for hemorrhagic colitis. And if the bloody stool doesn't get better, then we would define them as having GI involvement in the setting of having other clinical features of KS. If somebody has ascites that's not attributable to other cause, so the same idea, start treatment for tuberculosis, and if they don't get better, then we would attribute that to KS, or if they have dysphagia, um, especially in the setting of bulky kind of oral pharyngeal lesions. Um, as you can see in the photos there, they're kind of a bulky palate lesion that can result in dysphagia. And then there are um, some important differences between kids and adults with KS. Um, in children, lymph node involvement is quite common, and then KS in adults, lymph node involvement is less common and it's less predominant. In kids, cutaneous involvement is not always present, whereas in adults, cutaneous involvement is almost always there. In children, there can be a bad prognosis if you have disseminated or widespread skin disease. If you have more than 20 skin lesions, that can be associated with higher risk of mortality. And in adults, it's not necessarily so prognostic. Both kids and adults can have a chronic kind of indolent woody edema. In kids, that tends to happen in older patients, typically adolescents. Both kids and adults have worse prognosis if you have visceral disease. Amongst kids, cytopenias, severe thrombocytopenia and anemia are pretty common, and that's unusual in adults. And KS in kids can happen in patients who have a normal CD4 count, whereas typically in adults, patients have very low CD4 counts. And then KS in children tends to be more aggressive, especially in the lymphadenopathic form. Those patients are cura potentially curable if they get chemotherapy quickly, but if they don't, they can have a fulminant um, clinical course, whereas KS in adults is more often indolent. Um, some patients could respond to ART alone. In contrast, almost all kids need chemotherapy plus ART. 
And then patients can get endemic um, KS, so KS that happens in somebody who's not HIV positive. We had about three patients here in Mbeya. It hasn't happened very often. I think if you do diagnose a patient and you think it's endemic KS, it's really important to make 100% sure about their HIV status. So try to get antibody tests as well as a viral load test, um, really to be completely sure. Um, the treatment is the same for somebody with endemic KS, with the exception that they don't get ART. And then this um, paper looking at endemic patients in Malawi um, found, had described clinical features of about 20 patients and found that they were pretty similar to in terms of their presentation and their outcomes to patients who were HIV positive, um, a little bit less visceral presentation amongst kids with endemic KS. But it is out there, especially in places with high human herpes virus 8 seroprevalence. prevalence. So it's good to keep on your differential. If you see someone with prototypical KS lesions, lymphadenopathy in an area with high human herpes virus 8. And then the general principles of treatment for Kaposi sarcoma in a um, low and middle income setting, some patients respond very well to a minimally myelosuppressive regimen. Patients who don't respond to a minimally myelosuppressive regimen may need more intense chemotherapy. And patients with stage four disease with that visceral involvement or with disseminated disease really need upfront chemotherapy. Intense, it's intensified either a three drug regimen with <clears throat> bleomycin, vincristine, and doxorubicin, or paclitaxel. Typically, after giving a starter dose of that minimally myelosuppressive regimen, we give that starter dose to make sure that they are stabilizing. A lot of times those patients have a lot of opportunistic infections, have severe acute malnutrition. And so we don't want to give them a really strong chemotherapy um, dose right at the beginning while we're giving them antibiotics and stabilizing their other issues. And then effective ART, of course, is key. So we start or change with the second cycle of chemotherapy. Patients with Kaposi sarcoma can get iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And starting ART after you give them chemotherapy can help to protect them from getting that, that scenario in which your immune system is kind of reacting to the Kaposi sarcoma and then it, um, it causes the Kaposi sarcoma to increase. And then which chemotherapy regimen to use? Um, so we've developed a protocol kind of with what we talked about where some patients do very well with minimally or mild, um, mild <clears throat> minimal or a minimally myelosuppressive regimen with bleomycin and vincristine, and then some patients need more intense treatment. And those patients who maybe don't respond well at first to the minimally suppressive regimen then need to go on and receive more intensified um, treatment. And so we developed this protocol to try to address different phenotypes of the Kaposi sarcoma. And paclitaxel, um, I think is sort of the next step for treatment for kids with Kaposi sarcoma. There was a nice study in Mozambique using um, paclitaxel and even amongst patients with very severe disease, patients did quite well. We have also used paclitaxel and we've had um, minimal side effects and we've had um, good responses even amongst patients who had more severe disease. And then amongst adults, there was a big study comparing paclitaxel with bleomycin and vincristine and with um, oral etoposide, and paclitaxel was quite superior. So I think as things move forward, paclitaxel will be the next step and hopefully will become more and more available for patients with Kaposi sarcoma living in LMICs. So in, we started our Kaposi sarcoma treatment program um, because in Mbeya, we have high um, HIV prevalence. The Southern Highland Zone of Tanzania has the highest HIV prevalence um, in Tanzania, an estimated adult prevalence of around 9.3%, in contrast with an overall adult prevalence of about 5% um, nationally. That coupled with the high human herpes virus 8 seroprevalence in Tanzania led to um, a lot of Kaposi sarcoma. And at, at the time, back in 2011, the only option for patients to get treatment for Kaposi sarcoma was for them to travel to Dar es Salaam, which is a 14 hour bus ride and was very difficult or just sometimes impossible for patients. And so we developed a program where they could get their Kaposi sarcoma treatment at our center. 
in Ambea and didn't have to travel all the way to Dar es Salaam. Our program includes evaluation by a pediatrician. We have tissue diagnostics <clears throat> that we've been able to um, to access through the Africa Teledermatology Project. Um, it's a great resource um, of dermatologists who are working with sites around the world. You can post questions and ask, uh, post photos and cases and then get responses typically within 24 to 48 hours. And then you can ship um, tissue biopsies out to University of Pennsylvania and get sophisticated tissue diagnostics. We have chemotherapy and supportive care. Of course, patients get their ARVs, their treatment for their other opportunistic infections all at our center, nutrition, their psychosocial support, and then palliative care. And we don't have an oncologist on the ground here in Mbea, but we have remote specialist support through the um, Global Hope Program, through the oncologists working at the National um, Hospital up in Dar es Salaam. And we've had some pediatric oncologists come to visit us um, from time to time. And just as a snapshot of our program, um, we between 2011 and 2017, we treated 72 patients with Kaposi sarcoma. All the chemotherapy is done as an outpatient. So they come in, they get their treatment, and then they're able um, to go back home. Um, and we had a two-year overall survival estimate of about 72%. Our um, event-free survival is lower. Um, it is common for patients to have either a, a relapsing course or to, if in the case, is, um, case of patients with woody edema to not necessarily achieve complete remission, but to go on and live with some residual woody edema. But we have, we're really happy with our um, overall survival for an HIV-related malignancy in a low middle income setting. Just to kind of compare treatment outcomes amongst other pediatric cohorts um, in Africa, our 72% survival is kind of on par with other um, treatment programs or a little bit above. We also had no patients who were lost to follow up thanks to the um, efforts of our social work team and our patient advocates who really make sure that there's a solid plan for patients to be able to get back to clinic to get their chemotherapy. And I think all that to say, I think a common thing uh, that to think about in the world of global health is don't let perfect be the enemy of very good. So just because you can't do something perfectly, don't let that be a reason that you that you don't do something at all. So sometimes you need to see what resources you have, what is possible. And sometimes you need to push that boundary a little bit. Um, this photo is from the Rift Valley that's near where I live in Mbea. And when you look out over the Rift Valley, sometimes you feel like you're at the edge of the world. And I say that to adequately care for these patients, to provide them comprehensive care, sometimes you need to go to the end of the world or it feels like it. So whether that means you know, calling every pharmacy in the country to figure out who has chemotherapy and who can ship it to you cold chain, whether that means, you know, contacting specialists across the globe to get um, advice about how to care for your patient. You know, sometimes you really need to push the envelope and go to the edge of the world to take good care of your patients. So I'm kind of coming to the end now, um, my take home points. So use your available resources to try to create practical, comprehensive patient-centered programs. Palliative care is a really important component of global child health. Um, not just for patients with living with HIV AIDS, but other um, common pediatric conditions that can impact kids, especially those in LMICs. And then Kaposi sarcoma is an important pediatric malignancy in areas with a high human herpes virus 8 seroprevalence. I'll turn my video back on if anybody has any questions or any, any thoughts for me. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. That was great. I've, um, I've seen you present on your Kaposi's work before, but never on the palliative program that you really developed and um, is flourishing. So thanks so much. Um, I'll open it up to others. If you want to come off mute and ask a question, or if you feel more comfortable putting it in the chat, feel free. Also, if you have any questions about my career in global health, please do feel free to ask us that as well. Oh, hi, um, Sonia. Yeah, I'm a PEDS um, first year resident um, at UCSF. Thank you for the great talk. 
Um, I just have a question about like how receptive patients and families are um, when they're introduced the concept of palliative care. Um, because from my experiences here, sometimes family have a difficult time, um, especially when we try to introduce the concept of palliative care. So I was wondering, um, are there unique challenges or are there any positive um, um, reactions from families and uh, patients? So. Yeah, that's a great question. That's one area where I feel we're so lucky to have our kind of comprehensive multidisciplinary team. Um, our palliative care nurse is really, really amazing at, at breaking bad news, at kind of having tough conversations with families and exploring their hopes and their, their fears. Um, and sometimes introducing the, the topic in a little bit of a, a stepwise and a slow way. Our experience has been that people really appreciate that you people be us being open with them and taking the time to really talk through what's going on, talk through possibilities, try to help be a safe space for them to, to share what they're worried about. Um, so we, we haven't had challenge at times when people don't want to talk about palliative care, we're really careful when we're involving adolescents, making sure that their caregivers are on board with what we're talking, what, how much the adolescent knows about what's going on, trying to make sure that everybody's all on the same page. And we really try to use a team approach where everybody has a role in taking care of our patients. So we always talk about that the physician has a role, the parents have a role, the, the patient themselves has a part. And we found that to be pretty empowering um, and help them as we're talking about tough conversations. But I think it's really building that relationship in a slow and kind of safe way is really important. Uh, Leanne, I have a question for you because I think um, one of the things you said really resonated with me and um, I was wondering if, if you would be one willing to share your email so folks um, can follow uh, yes. up with you um, if they have additional questions. But you know, I, in the places that I've worked clinically, I, it definitely seems like there's um, there's a paucity of uh, palliative care. I think knowledge and awareness, as well as um, to the point you made about using what's available. Um, so it's not like reinventing the wheel. It's about assessing what you have available and then using those resources. And that's really, um, I think that's such an important concept for feasibility as well as sustainability. Um, do you have, is there a way to access um, I, that the toolkit that you said about how to um, use what's locally available to deliver palliative care? Yeah, that, that international, um, the ICPCN, the International Children's Palliative Care Network, has great resources. It's got that whole book you can download for free. Um, it's got modules on there. Um, that really, I think, helps people with if they want to implement a palliative care program. I think we've really found that it doesn't have to be expensive. A lot of it is is just having somebody who's dedicated and who's willing to do that communication. So if a site really had very little money, you know, accessing oral morphine and analgesia is certainly important. And I think that is scaling up for the most part in many sites across sub-Saharan Africa. But just having a person who's willing to talk with families, sometimes to share that phone number as part of the hotline, that if that was your bare minimum and then a trying to address symptoms, that could be done on a very, very low budget. Even our Make-A-Wish program we run is, is very, it is inexpensive. It's like $20 a patient. Uh, we fundraise or get grants to help to cover that. But I think yeah, using all of that, seeing what is available where you're working and then seeing how that could be built on. Um, it, it, I think palliative care can, it can definitely be scaled up. And my email is on the next slide as well. So definitely people can reach out. My WhatsApp is on there too. If I can help you at all, please feel free. Uh, Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, I had uh, two questions. One um, that's just a kind of a clinical one, and then uh, another one on on careers. Um, the clinical one was I always associate uh, Kaposi sarcoma with HIV, so it was really interesting to hear that there's HIV negative uh, cases as well. 
And uh, was just curious, you, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's primarily in high prevalent areas. Is it also associated with other uh, immunosuppressed cases like, you know, let's say malnutrition or is there, is there some in, you know, otherwise healthy children that you might see? Um, so that's the clinical question. And then the career question is, um, thank you at the beginning for walking through your career path a little bit in terms of the places that you, you know, or the programs that you, uh, worked with. Um, we have a number of trainees on the call and was just curious if you could describe your thought process behind, like, why did I apply? Why did I choose to take that next step in that direction? Thanks. Sure. So you're right. Most Kaposi sarcoma we think about in happening in somebody, you know, with HIV or someone who's immunosuppressed. Um, but we have seen cases, like I said, we we don't haven't seen a lot, um, but kids who are otherwise pretty healthy, maybe some some moderate, not necessarily severe malnutrition, who you know live in this high human herpes virus eight seroprevalence area and then go on to develop um, Kaposi sarcoma. Our most recent Kaposi sarcoma diagnosis was actually an HIV negative child without malnutrition who's four who, who developed Kaposi sarcoma. So it can happen. It's unusual. Um, the program in Malawi has had about 20 patients. We've had about four um, over our decades. So it's, it's unusual, but it's out there. Um, I always tell my colleagues when they contact me about a patient who they think is an endemic case, they think is HIV negative, I usually encourage them to try to get a viral load as well, just to be sure, because there can be some limitations with the antibody testing. And we've had it occur where somebody had negative antibody tests, and then the viral load came back positive. So you just, and you want to make sure you know their HIV status so that you can start ART if they need it. Um, and then, sure, so my career process um, I am from Colorado, so I was a, had in-state tuition and so chose to go to University of Colorado, um, largely because of the in-state tuition. I didn't want a, a, the, my medical school debt to be too big because I thought that could be a limiting factor in doing global health in the future. Um, they didn't have a lot in the way of global health. It was this was back in you know many years ago, so the global health was just starting to develop. But I did have the opportunity to go to Ethiopia in the summer between my first and second year of med school, and then spent some time in India during my fourth year of med school, and then. With the Stanford program as well, they also didn't have a whole lot in the way of global health when I went there for residency, but they definitely had the flexibility and the openness to it. Um, and I, when I was an intern, got to meet with some of the um, the ID fellows who had rotated at that hospital in Malawi, and it sounded like an amazing experience. And so then was able to incorporate that into my uh, training during my second and third years of residency, and then went to Thailand to meet with an HIV program during my third year of residency. And I've always been really connected and interested in issues related to HIV. And so that kind of <clears throat> prompted my interest in applying for the Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative. Um, at the time, it, there weren't very many options if you wanted to do full-time clinical care in a setting outside the United States. I looked at MSF, but I was in a serious relationship and I couldn't go with my husband or my husband now if we did MSF and it seemed a little bit dangerous. And so then applied for a position with the Baylor International Pediatric Age Initiative and kind of we thought we might do a couple of years. And then we came here and it was sort of at the time that the clinic was um, scaling up. We were code medical directors of the clinic for five years and really got the opportunity to develop a lot of these programs. And so then have wound up staying all this time. <laughs> so, yeah. That's kind of my path. Hopefully, hope that helps to answer it. I think one of the things too that just to point out about your path too is that you're a general pediatrician and yet you have these um, skills that you've sought out in oncology and palliative care. And so, you know, to for the trainees on the call who are trying to decide between different paths, it's just to say that everyone's path is different and you don't necessarily have to like subspecialize in any particular field to still do the work that's really meaningful. Um, so just to keep that in mind. Can I also ask to it um, for the trainees on the call? I know that it is possible for residents to do rotations. Is that something that's up and running again um, now that the pandemic is? 
I don't know. As far as I'm aware, <laughs> I don't know what to call yeah, it. As far as I'm aware, we host um residents for one month's rotations. Um, of course, it was on pause with the pandemic, and we haven't had someone yet. Um, the process to do it for a resident who's outside of Baylor is a little bit complicated, but it is possible. We've hosted many, many residents, and I, I think it's a good experience. Um, for you know, predominantly outpatient HIV, you can get exposure to our palliative care and malignancies and tuberculosis program and things like that. So if you are interested in trying to do a one month rotation at our site or at another Baylor site, you know, please feel, you feel free to reach out to me. I can put you in touch with the right people to sort of help make that happen. I have a quick question. Um, I was curious with regard to palliative care, if the places that you're offering those services, you make a distinction between palliative care and hospice. And uh, if so, what are the resources available to offer hospice care? So here in the Southern Highlands of Tanzania, we don't have any hospice at, at all. Um, there, so if somebody is needing really that end of life care, who's amongst one of our patients, we we try to talk with them ahead of time, do some advanced care planning to, to make sure everybody's clear about, do they want to be in a hospital? Do they want to be at home? Of course that can change at any point. So we're we're in really close communication with, with families. There are, can be a lot of costs associated with being in the hospital. So, so Families are also aware of that, those kinds of decisions, and then uh, like visitation or ability to be with a child or an adolescent can be quite limited in the hospital. So, so when we're talking about options with families, we really make sure that they understand kind of what the scenario would be like if they're in the hospital, if they're at home, and try to help them make as the best decision for them that's possible. Um, we have that day program where usually it's uh, amongst adolescents. Well, they maybe want to be at our clinic every day. We've had some adolescents who wanted to pass away at our clinic. They felt like the clinic was like their home. And so if that's what they want, we try to facilitate that. We haven't had that happen in a while, but um, that is kind of like a like an outpatient hospice in a way. Um, so with the palliative care, it our approach doesn't have to be only patients who are at the end of their lives. So we'll incorporate palliative care, that symptom management into patients who are still getting curative care. We think they're going to survive their illness just for them to get more psychosocial support and a little bit better uh, attention to detail surrounding their symptoms. And then they get um, better multidisciplinary care, and they also get fast-tracked in clinics, so they get all of those benefits of the palliative care program, but certainly not all our patients are, are approaching the end of our, their lives. Hope that answered your question. Well, it's, it's really been a pleasure um, talking with you all today. You'll be hearing actually from my husband in a couple of weeks. He's he's giving a lecture as well. So you'll get to meet him and hear more about what he does and what we do here in Mbeya. Thank you so much, Leanne. Really appreciate the time. And especially because this is not even, you know, during your normal week no or problem. work day. So no appreciate problem. that. Um, and then for those who are on the call, if you would